Hi, this is Professor Chuck Wood coming at you from Duquesne University. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, the software and, and uh, implement and security through the software development. You know, mainly the interview questions that you'll come across and maybe it'll help you with a little bit of understanding on things you need to understand when you're managing the process. Okay, so first, what phase of the software development life cycle, the SDLC, should you implement security? And uh, it's kind of a trick question because the answer is all of them. Uh, the, the problem that we have is that uh, our classes, classes at other universities, um, um, when we took our classes, when we learned how to program, they had to just the software development life cycle where we'd have analysis, design, programming, uh, you know, implementation, testing, and requirements first. And uh, then, then we'd, we'd teach them these steps on how to develop software. And then somewhere else we'd say, oh, you have to secure the software too. And uh, to tell you the truth, we're still guilty of this. But uh, the problem you have is that when you implement the software development lifecycle, you're going to have this software process develop this huge monolithic structure and then somebody says, now let's secure it. And you end up securing the inputs and outputs and not really looking too closely at inside because it works and you don't want to change it because it works now. And you don't want to add things to it because it might not work. If you add things to it, it might take a lot more work. Okay, so the problem with that is then this internal black box is going to be hacked because it's hackable. There's no security in there. All I have to get through is your inner and outer controls, and I'm fine. Okay, so so that's why uh, a lot of organizations now insist on the security question, how are we securing the data, what are the parts we need to secure in every single phase of the software development life cycle. So when you get the requirements, you say, what are the security requirements? When you do the analysis, you say, what security considerations do we need to put into the system? When you do, do design, Specifically, how are we going to secure the system? When you code, what is the code we need to write a secure system? And so um, uh, that's something that is not taught too well, but you need to do it. If you don't do it, you're introducing weakness into your, into your systems. Now, the um, next is, uh, how has our view of data changed over the past decade? Okay, data used to be uh, this idea of an expense. Okay, where how much how much disk drive space do we need? How can we get rid of the data we put on there? When can we finally delete the data? When when uh, is the data no longer viable? And it's gone from that to an asset. We want to keep all the data. We want to build on this data. This data is worth something. Now the problem with that is it used to be that the data had a limited shelf life, and you got rid of it. It went from that to we're keeping this data forever. So 20 years from now, people could hack into you and get your data, or hack into the people you gave data to and hack into that data. Um, so you want to be very careful on who you give your data to, on the security measures that they put in, because they're keeping your data forever because it's an asset. And they're not getting rid of it like they would in an expense. Okay, um, and uh, okay, the next question is, what is an object report repository? And why is that important to information security? Okay, um, with object-oriented, when uh, in the uh, even several decades, two decades at least uh, ago, uh, it became popular to develop things in an object-oriented manner. However, the organizational structure still hasn't changed. So we still have a payroll group developing payroll applications, a finance group developing finance applications, human resources doing human resource applications. And uh, we're all developing our own objects that we often don't share. This is probably a mistake for, on several uh, levels, but one is security. So the, the idea here is that if you develop, test, and do security measures to a common component that everybody uses, you don't need to do it again. You don't need to test it again. It's already been tested. Um, it, it's a, a new software that uses the, these controls uh, is more secure and inherently than software that's developed from scratch without any prior code use. So an object repository needs to be managed, needs to be trained, and it's good for information security to use one too. And not only that, but you'll probably save money if you implement one. 
Okay, then the next question is, what is the capability and maturity model? To tell you the truth, I'm not that big of a fan, but the capability and maturity model says that to develop good software, you need to be a mature organization. And there are five levels, but I don't really see the need to get into the levels. You start off being running around, no requirements, everything is, I need this now, I need this now, I need this now. If this sounds like your organization, then you are at the very low end of the capability maturity model. Um, if your organization uh, is, we have testing protocols, testing procedures, policies put in place, there are no heroes, everyone is doing the job they assign, when they're done, everything works, it's all like clockwork, that's mature. And so, um, the problem with that is, uh, a lot of times software can be developed pretty well in an immature organization. Uh, but the capability and maturity model is supposed to uh, get you thinking in terms of a policies and procedures needed to develop quality software to put your organization less at risk during the software development process. And uh, so uh, in that sense, the capability and maturity model does have some benefit, and it is on the CISSP uh, study materials everywhere, and it, it, it is on the CISA study materials everywhere. So, so the you know those those uh, 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 might be re, you know might be required reading for you to at least understand it and understand why it's why it why it has an appeal and why people like it. Okay, and then finally, what are the two aspects of software quality? Okay, so software quality has two aspects. One is functional. Does it do what you said it would do? So this is the functionality. If we have a requirements document we bring it in. That does the software do what it is supposed to do? Uh, the, uh, the, the other component is structural. Does it do it well with speed? Is the code maintainable? Is it uh, 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 integrate well with other, other uh, systems? So the structural doesn't have anything to do with what the software does, but pretty much how it does it. Okay, and so that's important. Now, if you're uh, studying for your CISSP, you'll notice that the software quality uh, section deals a lot with concepts of software development and not so much with how you ensure the information security of that, except in, in certain areas. And, and, and uh, uh, But you need to know about the software development and the process that it goes to uh, in that. So that's my uh, final words. Uh, thank you for visiting my channel. Uh, subscribe, and uh, we, we come out with new uh, interview questions, new videos all the time. And uh, the, uh, 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 there's also a link in the description for my uh, book area where you can buy books that I'm writing, and I'm also coming up with new chapters. Anyway, uh, take care, and thank you very much.